Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's interview. I always in interview entrepreneurial women who have made a leap from doing something that they loved but felt a little dis discomfort into something else that they love, that they feel really passionate about, that fills them up. Today, I am talking to Brioni Grealish. She is the fingerless chef. And she has a TV show where she hosts a cooking show. She is a chef and she is a public speaker. And her story is really interesting. Um, she won't really be talking very much about her background, but there's tons of information out there on her background and how she came through life without her fingers, really. It's amazing. And all that she has done to create a life that is meaningful and fulfilling to her. So, Brioni, thank you so much for giving us your time today. I appreciate it so much. Thanks, Jen, for having me on. I'm glad to talk about it and share my story with everyone. So you and I met at a local event, uh, at a WISE event, and WISE stands for Women Igniting the Spirit of Entrepreneurship. And that's where I first met you and heard your story, and I was like, I really want to talk to this woman because she's done some hard shit, way harder shit than most of us have to deal with because I have 10 fingers, right? Like that right there gives me an advantage over somebody who's got to then go over that hurdle. So I knew that I wanted to talk to you today. So really, again, thank you for agreeing to chat with me You're today. You're welcome. Okay, so let's talk about, tell us a little bit about your background. I know that you started as a social worker. Where did you go? What was going on when you were a social worker? Where did you know you wanted to go? Oh, you know, this is the crazy thing. I went to school for social work, graduated from college, went into my community because that, that's what I thought my community was that I needed to serve, was the one that I lived in. And so I worked on the west side of Syracuse for 11 years, working in the HIV and AIDS community, working with adults with disabilities, and then working with children and family with kids with mental health issues or kids with um, severe behavioral issues and doing a lot of family-based intervention work. Um, but I realized two months in to my job that I never wanted to do it again. <gasps> two months in. Two months in. But what did I do? I you stayed stay. because I stayed because I got pregnant in those two months when I started work. So I had a I had a son coming. And then I was gonna have a baby, and so I stayed. And then I had another kid and I stayed because it was a steady job with the decent income and how could I do anything else because I had to take care of a family. I hear this so much. You know who I hear this from? Uh, social workers, teachers, therapists, nurses. Mm -hmm. And they know that they want something different, but there's a paycheck and there's a, um, there's a retirement system and there's benefits and there's um, yes. known, a known paycheck coming in. And that's why I kept staying. I, I, I hated my work. It wasn't fulfilling. It was way stressful. It didn't suit who I was, how I needed to work. Because even though, you know, my hands are my disability, I also had a learning disability growing up, dyslexia and ADD. And so that made a job of social work, which is 90% paperwork. Paperwork. Oh my god. Painful. Girl. <gasps> Painful. Whoa. Because it's hours and hours and hours of typing. Yes. And reading. And it hurt and my reporting. heart. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it, it's it such a hard job. And so so I you did that job for how long? Eleven years. Okay. Between couple different agencies. Oh my God. Okay. So tell, so I know a lot of women who are in your exact situation where they are now, they tell themselves that they have to, have to, have to, should, 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 they should all over themselves. Right. So yes. tons of shooting. Tons of shooting. Um, what does that feel like in your body when you know this is not the right fit for you, but you have to stay? Well, it started out as like, a low uncomfort, like, you know, this is uncomfortable when it feels like you could feel it in your ch chest and it's heavy. And I ended up, it grew, it grew into a monster and the monster was depression. Oh my God. That's such it a really great way to put it. I already have tears in my eyes about it because I got so depressed 
that I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I lost the woman that I was. I was holding it together to be a mother to my boys and to be a wife and just to have some existence. But I wasn't living at all. I wasn't living. And there were mornings that my husband had to actually uh, tell him to push me out of bed because I would be tears streaming down my face knowing this wasn't right for me. And being in an environment where people weren't always very supportive or helpful or understanding of my disability needs with like the dyslexia and oh. the writing parts, but then just not fit feeling like I ever fit in. And so I'd actually have my husband push me out of bed in the morning and I'd go to work tears down my face oh my God. and I could feel my whole body shake. And every day I just go, I don't want to do this. I can't do this anymore. This isn't right. And oh. can we also talk I, you know, about, <clears throat> so hard. Can we also talk about the emotional part that you're experiencing? Can we also talk about how freaking hard being a social worker is? Like that work is so defeating and you need so much resilience and strength to just do that job. You know, and I had resilience in the beginning. Yeah. In the beginning it was, I went on the, I've got to do this. This is what I came for. I'm going to help my community. We're going to help these people. And then it just gets into this, role of you feel like you're spinning your wheels with people and you see people who need so much and they don't take your help. Yeah. Yeah. They they don't take it. And you're like, Oh my God. I know. You're so that just adds to the depression that you're and the heaviness and the weight. So how and, did you, you know, know how did you know um that there were you knew there was a, you knew that you wanted to do something else. Did you know what that was? Like you could feel it in your body, but did you like know what it was supposed to be? And you know, the funny thing is that I knew I was supposed to do something when I was a kid. Hmm. When I was a kid, I knew, like, and it kind of was like a flutter inside of me that, and I'd stand outside and listen to the wind. <laughs> and I know it sounds funny, but yeah. I could actually hear something calling to me saying there was something important I'm supposed to do. Oh my God. That I need to do it. And this is when I was, this was when I was a kid. And you kind and of ignored it and went into social work. I did because I thought that's the helping, right thing right? to do. I'm supposed right. to help. Right. And it <clears throat> wasn't, of course. And through the years, I continue to hear it call. And over the years, it keeps getting stronger. And then sometimes it fizzles away because I was too depressed to hear it. But I didn't know what it was. And then about seven years ago, I had an idea to do a cookbook. And it was the Fingerless Kitchen Cookbook. And I was going to help teach and inspire people with disabilities to cook. Because there was nothing on the shelves, right? There was nothing on the shelves. There's no cooking shows that are talking about it. Nobody representing my community mm -hmm. and how to do things in the kitchen when you don't have everything that everybody else has. So is that something and, that's, um, that had been kind of um, easy for you or not easy for you, but is that something that had that you had mastered at home? Like, do you love to cook? Did you love to cook? Do you love food? Oh, I've been cooking since I was eight. And I mean, I was adopted and I'm the only one in my family with hands like this. And I never knew anybody else like myself. Mm -hmm. So I only had myself to go on and I had to teach myself how to do everything. And for so me, this, everything takes extra steps. Right, right, right. So you had been doing it a long time and you figured it out for yourself. Yes. And then so you tapped back into this foundational thing that kind of brought you joy and that brought you satisfaction. Mm -hmm when you could pull yourself out of the depression long enough to like listen to the whisper again. Yes. And so I start doing recipes and learning for food photography and I got really excited. And then I went, what are you doing? Mm. Like, right. You know, it's the questions that you yeah. start giving yourself. It's the, who <laughs> am I to do this? I'm not the authority. Um, what am I going to leave this job and not have any money for my family? Mm -hmm. You know, it was just big questions are like, you're <clears throat> going to fail. So why even try? And I literally packed it all up 
and put it in a drawer. Oh. Like not even figuratively. I literally just packed everything up and shoved it in a drawer and said, okay, you know what? I just reality check, go back to social work, just do what you're supposed to because you have a job and you have a family. And I let it go. And that's more when the depression really started. Like okay. in those last few years, it ramped up really hard. So it was kind um, of a passion project while you were still a social worker. It was a passion project. Mm -hmm. And then your mental chatter got the best of you. And I know that this is true for every uh, creative entrepreneur, creative solopreneur out there. Uh, they all struggle with this. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Right. Mm -hmm. Whether you're whether you're starting a business, growing a business, taking it to the next level. Everybody has this negative mental chatter. What I know is at that moment, you need somebody to walk alongside of you. Who did you were you missing that piece? Were you missing the tribe of women or, or somebody who could help you get out of your head? Yeah, I, I was. I mean, I have friends. Mm -hmm. And I don't always think that people understand what you're doing when you become an entrepreneur. No, I agree. I 100% like, agree. Yeah, you leave a job. And Why like, would you leave a job? And you go for the unknown. Because, yes. you know, you grow up going, you go to school, you go to college, you get a job, you work that job. That's what you do. This is the normal world. <laughs> and it's not the normal world. And I, you know, I think this is pretty an awesome world. And Really, I think in the last year, I found a tribe of women. Awesome. And, and that, so when, when you were like, I'm putting this in the drawer, I'm going back to social work, and then something got so bad that you were like, I can't do this anymore. What was that moment? Because I think women need to know they get so far down there. What was the, fuck this, I need to now do this? Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't talk about that. I'll, I'll explain my moment, but, I don't talk about exactly what happened, just uh -huh. out of respect for sure, 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 and, and all of that. Sure, but I had an idea in like January of what 2016, and okay. it was for a catering company. You know, and and I looked at that and I said, you know what? Why not? You know, like why not at this point? Because it was so low and so crappy, and I felt so bad that the idea of doing something on my own the way I needed to do it for my disability and my needs as for my family and something that would make me happy and excited. It was enough of a spark to get me to say, forget this, but it took a while Yeah, from January to June. I, I quit my job in June. So I mean, it's a half a year that I kind of thought about this idea, researched that whole, you know, like the whole background. And, and then there's some days got so nasty and people got so nasty. I said, why am I living in this? Mm -hmm. Why am I working with people who disrespect me constantly mm -hmm. and don't, you know, they want my help, but they won't respect me for it. Yes. What yes. kind of life am I living and what am I showing my children? So what happened in June that year? Um, June, I ended up having a photo shoot for the Syracuse Women's Magazine where I did a little, um, like my own story. I did my own in her own words story. Mm -hmm. And it was about what I was tr starting with the fingerless kitchen that I had this idea and I, you know, I was going to go for it. And then I realized, you know what? This is far more fun <laughs> <laughs> than, than going to work being people being nasty to me and not treating me well. And um, wh wh why would I ever do that to myself? And I really, I looked at my husband, I'm like, I'm done. There's no plan. I really looked at him like done. And I put in my two weeks notice mm -hmm. and I shook. I was typing out this letter and my whole body was shaking the entire time. And I'm like, okay, you can do it. You know, I'm pumping myself up and I'm still shaking. I wrote it. I put it in envelopes and shot it in the mailbox and then started to freak out because it was in the mailbox and I couldn't take it back. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I'm still shaking the whole time I shook. And I went back and cleaned out my office immediately. Like I, 
packed everything up and put it right in the car because I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen after they found out. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was going to pack up and be prepared for whatever happened next. And um, that that moment when I left work that day, and this is the um, this is the most amazing feeling, but it also makes me sad at the same time is I left and I was still trembling with fear Mm -hmm. that I had just made this horrible mistake that my family wasn't going to be supported. We were going to like lose everything, Mm -hmm. but I drove to pick up my husband and my kids and I went from shaking to uncontrollable sobbing, but it wasn't sobbing of sadness. It was the most unbelievably freeing moment of my entire entire life Mm. of my entire life like I actually felt like the whole entire world had been taken off of my shoulders and that I was free like I I was in my own prison for 11 years of my own making and I never realized that was my own making but it I did after 11 years in like hell yeah you can't see it when you're in it no but once I realized that it I was going to be okay. Somehow we'd figure it out. And I just, I don't know. That was just the most amazing and emotional experiences of my life. Well, even you and retelling it is incredibly emotional to receive that story. So I thank you for reliving it because for me to even hear it second, third hand, right? Like it's so, it's like, it's, it's so far removed now. It's two and a half years later. Um, it's very emotional to hear it. So you said we would figure things out. I just knew that we would figure things out is what you said. I knew that it would work out. So tell me, how did you go about figuring it out? Because uh, uh, that's never a straight line. Through. It's not. It's, you know, one of those. <laughs> yes, it's a mess, ones. zigzaggy thing. And I'm still figuring it out because it's it's not been a perfect road. And it's been a really hard two and a half years. And, I mean, it's. It was hard at my job. This has been, I've cried a lot. Mm -hmm. I've um, talked a lot with my husband. I've written down like tons of notes of where I think I should go and what I should do and how I should do it. But it never works out exactly the way you think it's going to. No, it never does. Mm -mm. You know, we we had some money saved when I left, (laughs) but that got used up fast and trying to figure out, you know, side jobs and learn as much as I can about my business, about just how to do anything. You know, I, I, I don't even know how, how I got here sometimes. Mm-hmm. What was your very first but, step? So you're done with the job. You feel a weight. Mm-hmm. What's, and I always tell my clients, what's the very next thing you know how to do? So what was the very next thing you knew how to do? Well, Okay, I will say this. I stopped learning how to relax. Mm -hmm. And so what I first did is take two weeks to myself like it was a vacation Mm -hmm. and let myself feel it and be okay with it. That's brilliant. You know, I didn't do much before that because I was still going to have some bills and there was going to be some money I could get from, like, retirement because I didn't have that much in it, so we were going to use it. And... I gave myself the permission to be okay and go outside and lay in a hammock, Mm -hmm. go look at some flowers, take a walk, listen to music, drink some tea, and just be okay with who I was in the moment. That's brilliant. And what did you learn? What did those two weeks give back to you? My life. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave myself my life back when I put that – notice in yeah right when I put that notice in I reclaimed my life and then two weeks after I was done with work I continued to reclaim it and I could hear myself again Mm. you you know like you you can hear your your inner thoughts and the the self-dialogue well I'd lose that to negative dialogue of course but then I allowed myself to do what I needed to for me Mm -hmm. and for my children and for my future and It was, again, freeing. Like, I was outside going, I can have a life where I can be home and do things that I want and follow any kind of passion and somehow we'll figure it out. 
you know, any which way, we'll figure it out somehow. And we're still going along. <laughs> yeah. So I'm did you, and that's the journey of the entrepreneur is we figure it out as we go. A lot of entrepreneurs mm-hmm. think I need to go to business school because business school is going to teach me everything. And what I know is that you can go to business school, you can have a degree and then you can come into your own business, especially as a solo service provider mm-hmm. with no, you know, you don't know really what's next and you are only figuring it out as you go. Even if you have um, a paradigm or you have somebody helping you, you really are figuring it out for yourself as you go along. What, you know, here's best practices. This is how I'll make it work for me. Here's the way that some people do marketing. Here's how I'm going to make it work for me. Like you really do have to make it your own. Absolutely. Your point of being able to listen to yourself and get quiet enough in your head, that makes it that much easier to make it work for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good. That's gold. And, you know, having issues with attention uh-huh. So it's so hard for me to stay focused, right? Sure. <laughs> this becoming an entrepreneur, even though it's still really hard work, mm-hmm. like all the research and all the learning and all the trying to figure out everything on a day-to-day every basis day. from scratch. <laughs> yeah. Every single day. Every single day. It It's still more flexible for me because I can work in how I need to, the way my mind works. Right. And the way I need to for my hands, right? And, but I couldn't get that in a regular job because they'd ask you, what's wrong with you? Yes. And you go, oh, well, you know, this ADD and sometimes I switch my numbers around is, uh, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> doesn't work for them. But you know what? In the, being an entrepreneur, I can figure out how to make it work for me. Yes. Right? And you might, and, and the interesting thing that people don't know about entrepreneurs when you have a job, when you have an employee mindset, which I think if people have, I had an employee mindset for a long time. I was a teacher. I couldn't fathom having to create my own income. Like I got a paycheck. I had a, I had benefits. Like, um, so I didn't have that. And I worked hard as a teacher and I work hard as an entrepreneur, but I work hard on my terms and I work yep. hard when I need to work hard. And I, you know, it, 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 there's a shift that you make that you have to have quiet in your mind in order to really do that work. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad you got that for yourself. So you were a caterer. How did that go? That was your first idea. How did it go? Oh, uh, not well. <laughs> okay. It went okay. You know, I didn't really make good money and I didn't have a lot of money to start out with. Mm-hmm. I did start a GoFundMe page. I raised some money. I was able to get some basics that I needed. So Mm -hmm. I got my LLC and I started getting tools and supplies and, and then it just kind of fizzled out because I didn't have money to really get product and then didn't have money to really kind of start promoting myself. And then I was, you know, just kind of off, Mm -hmm. (laughs) off track because it wasn't right. So what it wasn't right. I had a, what did that help you figure out was next? Because it's not a failure, right? It's just an iteration. It was. And, you know, it it was what I needed. Yeah. Because I figured this out last April. The catering company was just enough of a spark that got me to make the big enough change to believe that I could do something. Yes. And I think that's all it really was meant to do, was meant to show me that I could take a leap, go out there, start an LLC, start all these different parts, do the research, start making connections and, and do it. And, you know, and I, I realized that in April last year that it was okay if I let it go. Mm -hmm. When I realized that taking that cookbook idea and turning it into a real TV show Mm -hmm. to help reach more people with disabilities, hopefully across the world, would be more powerful and more meaningful and what right, I was catering to. party after party. Yeah, I love that. And it'll probably be a lot less work. You you can you know <laughs> maximize Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. More front work and way less uh in the business time, more kind mm-hmm. of on the business time. Um so where are you now with your cookbook idea and with your T V show? So with the T V show I've been doing a series of chef challenges. Okay. Talk to me about the um, chef challenges. Well, you know, I started these chef challenges because I thought it was the fun, the funnest way to get started. 
Mm -hmm. And really what I'm doing is I'm going into restaurant or bakery kitchens and I'm challenging chefs to cook like me with only pinkies. Mm -hmm. So we're taking up their hands. They only have their pinkies and we're doing a no thumb chef challenge. (laughs) And so right, most chefs and what I've heard even famous chefs talking about is, you know, your best tools in the kitchen are your hands and your fingers. That's what I've heard famous chefs say. Sure. And I'm like, hello. (laughs) My hands are so tiny. Mm -hmm. And that's their best tools, you know. And, okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to go in and take almost all your tools away. Yeah. So I'm challenging them as – them to see from my perspective Mm -hmm. you know this is what they do every day but could they do it if they didn't have what they thought they needed it's got to be very humbling for them when they when you go in there Mm -hmm. yeah and it's really interesting to hear them afterwards kind of when we're not rolling just say oh you know what there's this person I remember you know and and it helps them think about it from a different perspective Mm -hmm. and that's part of what the chef challenges are, are getting people to think about things in somebody else's perspective. And yes, like um, it's not just getting in there and you do like going mindless and doing like what your body is used to doing. It really makes the other chef be much more intentional about something that's almost probably like breathing to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it really, it slows you down and, you have to think about how are you going to do things. Yeah. How, how are you going to do this? Because you just took all their fingers away. Yeah. And they still have a little advantage because they have a lot of their knuckles right. still. So, <laughs> oh, well. But they have to start thinking of, is there something else I can use in the kitchen? Like It's creative problem solving in that moment that when you don't have what you need, you got to come up with what you can use. It's such a great metaphor. And it can be really be anything. It, well, I'm going to ask you to get back to that in a second. It's such mm-hmm. a great metaphor for building a business mm-hmm. because you, on a daily basis, you're like, this isn't working. I want it to be this. So the tools that I've been relying on aren't working anymore. Yep. Facebook algorithm has changed or whatever <laughs> it is, right? Um, uh. <laughs> right? So it's really a great metaphor for what we have to do as entrepreneurs, which is constantly get really intentional and think about what tools we need to relearn or what help we need to get to move forward and get our result. Yep. That's so cool. That's so cool. Do you also have a cookbook? I'm working on one. Okay. I've been I've been collecting my recipes and I have to start doing recipe testing now. Mm-hmm. And there's also I have to design a cookbook different than every other cookbook on the shelf. Cool. Cuz I figured at this point nobody knows who, and, you know, people know who I am, but I'm coming out of the woodwork right now and I'm going to self-publish one. Good. Right now. Um Good for you. What it needs to be is it really needs to be comprehensive in how I do it because I can't just write a recipe like every other cookbook because then it doesn't address what people need. And so part of the cookbook is going to be talking about tools, Mm -hmm. uh, tips on how I do things, and then talking with people with disabilities about that in the kitchen. What do they do? How do they adapt? Adaption, right. Yep, because – we're going to need that and also how others can help people in the kitchen. Okay. Right? Because there's going to be people with disabilities who don't, who can't do it all by themselves, sure. right? Because some disabilities just don't allow that. But does that mean they should be left out completely? Right. No, no. because kitchens are our community. That's where we gather mm. and connect. So why are they sitting in the other room? Because they can do something. And, Bring them in, bring them part of the, bring them in to be part of the family, to be part of the friends, to be part of the life that happens in the kitchen. So I'll want to talk about that for people who are assisting in the kitchen as well. Do you think your cookbook, so I really want to know who, who your target market is. Who's the ideal client that would be buying this cookbook 
or who's the ideal client who will be watching your TV show? So the thing with people with disabilities is mm -hmm. it's such a broad range. That's why so I'm I can't go, right. I'm going to go for moms who are between 25 and 45 sure. who are working me part time and taking care of, you know, like I can't narrow it down to a very tight scope because disability is on such a spectrum. Mm -hmm. But I'm really kind of hoping and that this is one of the hard parts for me is really kind of working that demographic, but I'm really hoping to get people with disabilities. I think mostly who can read, or at least if I do an audio book, oh, yeah, right. you know, <clears throat> listen, if there's vision impairments, but for the people with disabilities out there who are just still living as if they're hiding yeah. or trying to blend in, which I did in when I worked my job, I tried to make myself be normal. Yeah. Quote unquote, right. Yeah. To mix in. But then, you know, I hope the people who are going to watch the show are going to go, you know what? I can do it too. I can do something. So it's not just cooking, mm -hmm. but it's showing people with disabilities that you can get out there and make a job that fits your skills. That's right. And your passion, mm -hmm. not working in a job that doesn't support your needs. Like, so you're really showing people possibility. So you're mm -hmm. inspiring, you're motivating, you're educating them. And then what happens, what you and I know will happen is somebody will watch your show or read your cookbook or listen to your cookbook or mm -hmm. watch your cookbook because you might have a video cookbook at some point, right? And so. at some point. And then so they'll be, they'll do this hard thing that they've maybe never done before. And once you do one hard thing, you're like, damn, I did that hard thing. Maybe I can do this hard thing that's not in the kitchen. It's someplace else in my life. And you know that by inspiring and motivating and educating your ideal client in the kitchen, that that will help him or her exponentially in real life. Yes. That's why absolutely. you do what you do, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really what I'm, you know, cooking is my passion. Yes. And I'm trying to represent a community that's been completely left out of cooking. Yes. But then I want them to take the other part of it. And yes. is that personal empowerment and mm -hmm. saying, you know, I'm not going to let the world shut me out. Right. And I have, I, can a, do. I have a place here. Yes, I can do, period. I can mm -hmm. do. I can be part of this. Yes. What a Absolutely. great mission. I can see why it's so much more fulfilling to you than going to your job as a social worker, um, that you have control over your life and that you're using what has been your struggle now as a gift. Yes, and exactly. And I want to show other people that they can do that too. Yes. That, you know, like my hands don't have to be just, only two fingers that I have to try to deal with every day, but it, <laughs> my hands are actually me. I embrace the way they look. I don't try to change them. Mm -hmm. And I show people who I am, what I can do and how we can make other people's lives better, mm -hmm. right? Because we all deserve to be happy in this world and, and we don't deserve to be shut out, left out, treated as lesser. Mm -hmm. And, that we can have real joy in what we do and we don't have to just be qualified to empty trash cans. That's as right. Some people with That's disabilities right. get treated. Of course. Oh, this is such a like great should... message. Tell me. And, yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say kind of the other part of this is not just for people with disabilities, but also showing a typical person the amazing things that we can do. It really right, is a you know, two-way so, street, right? Like opens up opportunities mm -hmm. for people who are typical to see like, oh, my God, I don't have to think of this person as not able. I can include them if they want to be included. Yeah. yeah. So it's awareness, right? It's, yes. it's opening up awareness. But we're doing it with a cooking show, which people like cooking shows. People like food. <laughs> you get food at the other end. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. <laughs> One last question for you. Mm -hmm. What advice... Would you give to someone who's a creative, who's stuck in a place or a position or a thought that they, that makes them feel the way that you felt when your husband had to literally kick you out of bed in the morning? What advice? Oof. What's the very first thing that that person needs to do, think, be, feel? You know, I had to find anything that made me happy. Mm -hmm. 
and tell myself that it was okay to be happy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had a hard week last week. I wasn't feeling good. Mm-hmm. And I let that, I let that bring me down. Like I went massive headache and I was, I was questioning myself and I just, and I stopped myself and went, you know what? You got to stop it. You know, I actually literally set out loud to myself, no, mm-hmm. you're worth, you know, you, you, you are worth something. You are worth being happy, and every negative thought I have is going to create another negative thought to make me feel like crap. That's right. And it took a couple days of it, and I started putting on some music. I have a little playlist that's my, like, you know, pump me up and remember why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And just to keep remembering, when I move forward with my passion, that good things are happening, even though... Sometimes the world around me crumbles. Sure. It's a slow process. It is, but it's, it's the, it's the trying to remember that there's a life inside of me Mm -hmm. and a constant reminder that it's okay. No matter what's happening around you, it's going to be okay. You're, you know, you're still alive. We're still here. And, you know, I lost both of my parents Mm -hmm. 10 months apart. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think like the world is like like Django, right? You're playing this very delicate game and the world comes crashing down. But it's only a chance to rebuild it up, right? And I didn't die from it. Felt like it inside, but I don't know. It There's so much that I do every day to try to remind myself, you know, like I have a cup of tea. I sit and listen to the birds and I just remember there is beauty and there's life and it's outside of me and it's also inside of me and I've got to honor it. Great. And find mm-hmm. happiness anywhere I can and be grateful for it. So for somebody who is wanting to make a leap, the number one thing that you would suggest is tuning in to oh, your yes. inner self and also tuning out tuning to the outer world of the things that make you happy, even a little small spark of happiness, a little small, even, even the tiniest of, (laughs) even the tiniest of things, because we lose appreciation for all the little things we should be grateful for or find joy. I know we do. We do. Yes. I would think about it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I would love people to be able to follow you, uh, to learn more, Mm -hmm. to become more aware, to get inspired and educated. So how can people become a member of your community? So right now they can join me on my website so they can subscribe to um, the fingerlesskitchen.com. Okay. You can also find me on Instagram, which the fingerless kitchen with the underscore fingerless underscore kitchen. You got to love how that goes. I know. Right. And I, you know, I'm on Facebook as well. They can find me what I'm doing on Facebook with the fingerless kitchen. Right. Um, and just kind of, and YouTube, the same thing, the yes. fingerless kitchen. And just right. see so what many I'm good doing places shit. to find you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm around. <laughs> I am around. <laughs> yes. And eventually more people will hear about what mm-hmm. I'm doing. And the more I keep going and we'll, right. We keep like that train. We're getting that, yeah. Slow chugga chugga yeah. chugga choo choo. Yeah. Um, hopefully my next step after the chef challenges is that I'll get people in my kitchen with disabilities to cook with me. Awesome. Yes, that's a great and so goal. About tools and techniques. And so we're going to do the chef challenges. Then I'm going to work in another aspect and we're just one thing at a time. Cause if I don't, if I do too much, I'll get overwhelmed and that's then right. I'll feel, and then you feel stop. like giving up. So. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Well, I really appreciate your honesty and your vulnerability and your advice because you really have made the leap. You really, really did that work. Ooh, yeah, and I don't ever want to go back. Like, it actually terrifies me to think about going back to a regular job. Yes. And so it kind of pushes me forward to keep trying to make this work and yes. make a life that I can see for myself and my family and for the world of people I hope to uh to ignite, Inspire. right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, bravo to you. Thank you so much. Thank I'm so you. glad that I got to meet you. Brioni, thank you so much for your time. It was inspiring. It was educational. And I hear the same story 
from all kinds of female entrepreneurs. So I really want to make the point that whether you have a disability or you don't have a disability, like we all are dealing with the same nonsense in our heads. And so thank you for sharing your nonsense with us today. <laughs> you're welcome. There's a lot of craziness. <laughs> Girl, you're not alone. So I appreciate it. Bye, Brioni. Bye. Thank you. Bye.